Let's get going. We have an exam coming up on Thursday. It's our first midterm exam. Um, we have a bunch of homework. Uh, by the way, I made a mistake concerning the SI review tomorrow night. It's at 6 p.m. Better write that down. That was my mistake. Uh, I believe it's correct in web courses. Uh, Maria pointed it out on discussions. Uh, it was my mistake. We want to go over a few things concerning the test uh, so that you can uh, get in uh, to the exam and be ready to go uh, at a moment's notice so that uh, you can have the maximum amount of time. And just having more time is going to help you be less nervous. All right. First of all, we're going to have double homework tonight, and it's going to be due on Thursday. So um, you have a review set uh, and a regular assignment. And the regular assignment is a little bit large, but hopefully um, you'll be able to blaze through it and uh, with the review assignment, uh, prepare yourselves uh, for the exam uh, on Thursday. It is a 50-point test, as advertised in the syllabus. And it is mostly Scantron. So Scantron is multiple choice, matching, true-false, that kind of thing. And I think I'm going to have about 45 Scantrons uh, items. And then we're going to have three clicker items. And that will be on the very last page. Uh, you'll be able to, you know, and there will be plenty of room for scratch work. And you can write all over your test and everything. Um, and, Danya, we're going we're gonna to do a bunch of different um, <coughs> problems uh, on the iClicker 2 part. So... Um, so what you want to do is uh, bring a Scantron, of course. Any calculator that has a square root key is fine, uh, except not a cell phone. So if, if you don't have a cell phone, uh, you're just going to have to do a little bit of uh, fifth grade long division, I guess, on paper. Uh, and we have 75 minutes, theoretically, if we get going right at the buzzer, at 10.30, actually 50, we have uh, 80 minutes because we go until uh, 11.50. Uh, so doing a 60-minute test uh, should not be a big, bodacious uh, squeeze of time for you. Uh, but bring a calculator if you've got one. Uh, raspberry colored Scantron, the one that has the UCF Pegasus logo. And usually that's, that uh, vending machine down the hall has a bunch, uh, but I noticed this morning it's pretty much emptied out, so hopefully they'll get a bunch in there. And supposedly you can get them for free at the SGA office in the Student Union. Uh, with the Scantron, uh, I want to make a note to you, uh, if, especially you guys that are newbies here at UCF, um, you have to fill in your PID uh, where it says ID number. Uh, and your PID is a single letter followed by seven numerals. All right, so here's my phony PID, J550001. Um, and then you bubble those in. Now, if you don't do that, you're going to be on my bad list, my bad boy list, because... If, if you don't do this, you don't get a grade. And then I have to go through and dig out six, through 600 Scantrons and 600 exam forms that are not alphabetized for your paper. And so I'll remember your name. And in association with your name will be the fact that I'm going to be ticked off for doing that. But I'll do it. But the way to avoid getting on my bad boy list is just to remember your PID and bubble it in carefully. The other uh, things to bring are number two pencil and an eraser, of course, um, and then your eye clicker two. And your eye clicker two, um, as I mentioned before, we're going to use it for calculations 
two calculations, one uh, multiple choice item. And so, uh, and we're going to practice using it um, today at the end of class if we have time uh, with a little mini review uh, set um, in class. Uh, and it will be, it's called self paced. You'll be able to click at your own leisure, go back to question number one and do it again or slide ahead to number three if you want to do that with first and stuff like that. Self-paced polling versus what we do here in class. I, I'm in control of the pace of the questioning normally in class. But we're going to try self-paced polling at the end of class today. So it works really good. The other thing that you've got to do to avoid being on my bad boy list is bubble in the test form. Now, you don't have to worry about exam number. There's a slot on there for that. Uh, I don't have exam numbers, but I do have exam forms, A, B, C, or D. And usually they go by color. And so if you have pink, that's going to be exam form B or something like that. And all the green ones are going to be exam form A and so on and so forth. So hopefully, and this is another one where if you don't do this, you make my life uh, unpleasant. And so don't do that. It's just remember to bubble in test form. And I'll nag you about it on Thursday as well. All right, formulas. A couple students asked me in web courses and then at, in person out in the hallway, uh, Dr. B, what are we going to do for formulas? Do we need a formula sheet? Answer N-O. We do not need a formula sheet because uh, the first several items on the test, get your clicker out because we're going to do these ones here. Uh, the first several items on the test will be formula matching. You'll, you'll have a formula and some kind of a concept or definition, kind of like what you see up here. And you'll have to match them up. So the right-hand side of this uh, slide here, A, B, C, and D, that's the equivalent of a formula sheet. But this one, if you can recognize it and recognize its, its definition, and then connect it to the right definition or concept, uh, you get a point. So it's a little bit better, and it's a little bit easier to tackle. So don't worry about memorizing. Worry about recognizing. If you do the normal amount of studying, you should be able to name Most people get these, you know, 100%. All right. Now, let's try it out. All right. And, this'll, and also, in your homework number... In your review set number one homework tonight, you also have some matching, you know, a little extra practice. Anyway, so let's try this. Um, and let's try question number one. And for those of you that are uh, new with your clicker, we're on frequency AA. So push the power button until the, black, the big square flashes, then type in A and A. And uh, let's start the question. And go ahead and make a selection for number one. You guys are really going fast. 20 seconds. Ten seconds. Five, four, three. Two, one, zero. Okay. Yep, most of you got that one right. Number two, Newton's second law. Twenty seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Let's see what you guys voted for. Uh oh. A couple of you voted for uh, B and D. All right, we'll get to that. Let's go to the next question. Whoops. I skipped too far ahead. Well, I guess we'll just do two. Anyways, these are the answers. Uh, 
Uh, Galileo's new state of motion. Yeah, this is something new for me. I just kind of dreamed up this way to describe it. It's not a single uh, formula or equation, uh, but it's actually kind of a, a couple. So it's a little bit more than just an equation. Anyway, the, you'll be doing this for the first several items on the midterm. All right. And by the way, you guys did pretty good for number one and two. And somehow I blooped up number three. But uh, I gave you 30 seconds. And you got most of you guys had it in about 10 seconds. I mean, because I was watching the, the scoreboard up here. Most people had filled in their, their answer after about 10 seconds. So on the exam, I usually budget um, one minute per question uh, if it's all Scantron. Now, this one's not all Scantron, but it's 50 points. So if I want to stick to that budget, that ratio, I would give you 50 minutes. Now, in a... In practice, we're going to actually have 60 minutes, and so you'll actually have a little bit more than one minute per question. And on this one, uh, you took quite a short amount of time. So some of the questions you'll really have to think about. Other ones you're going to breeze right through if you do a normal amount of study. Questions about that? Yes? I don't know. What is the concept for B? Study question, the student shall become the master. What's the, what's the concept for B? What's that? Uh, ballistic arc, no. In the, incorrect. That's part of it, but that's not the best. In the back with the blue shirt. Distance triangle, okay, that's not bad. Free... Too gener generic. Blue shirt. Drop theory? Drop theory? No. Ooh, burning up. A what do you think? Drop distance. Why coordinate? For the Ferrari driving off a cliff. We did that last week. Uh, so let's keep going. Uh, last time we talked about Newton's first law which is the law of inertia that the velocity is constant uh, when you have zero net force. And that doesn't mean no forces necessarily, maybe no forces, but also net force zero uh, might mean several constituent forces acting, but they all balance. Another thing that we talked about last time was Newton's second law, which is about net force. F net equals MA. There's the vector version of it. Here's the scalar version uh, when you're just trying to get a, a size, you know the direction, everything. Um, and what we did last time was we talked about how to calculate it, how to sketch it, different forms, uh, A equals F over M. Um, the interesting thing is that the way that we know forces are acting, uh, whether it's a net force zero or a net force not zero, uh, we look for an acceleration or the lack thereof. Uh, here's another version, F equals M times the quotient delta V over delta T. And next Tuesday, we're going to take that one apart and put it together in chapter four when we study uh, the idea of momentum and energy. Here's another one that we talked about last week. The specially uh, used example, the weight force, uh, which has its own version of F equals MA. Weight force, capital W, equals MG. Uh, another thing that we talked about was the unit of force in the metric system. And that's 1.00 Newton uh, equal to a standard metric unit kilogram times um, one unit of acceleration in the metric system, 1.00 meters per second squared. All right. Now, uh, in that, Newtons cannot be measured. You know, like there's, there's no, you know, in, there's no big, uh, 
you know, a building in Paris that houses the International Newton inside of a, you know, a bell jar on a little pedestal. There is for the meter, but there isn't, and the kilogram, but there isn't for, uh, for the Newton because it's derived from uh, basic units of kilogram meters and seconds squared. So uh, what we're going to try to do is get some explan... Well, we might not be able to explain what... Is that a... You can't even tell what kind of dog that is. Except that he's really messy and he's having a nice day. Anyway, uh, let's talk some more about this idea of Newton's of force. We can't really... Ex we can't detect or observe a Newton of force, but we detect it by looking for accelerations. And um, specifically, the acceleration relative uh, to a particular path through space, whether it's a curved path, segmented path, straight line path, we've talked about all those. And here are the kinds of accelerations that you measure by analyzing the spatial path and also having some timestamp type information. You know, how fast does it go through that path? The shape and the timing of the path. Does it speed up? Does it slow down? Those are two different kinds of accelerations. Another one that we alluded to last week was the whole idea that a change of direction can signal a, uh, a force, a net force acting. And a change of direction is a delta V. And it would be a delta V as a vector. And so that you would, ha you would have to graph that up um, graphically on graph paper or something. And we're actually going to do that. We're going to do some sketching here in a few minutes uh, about change of direction accelerations. Um, you could have a combination of 1 and 3 or 2 and 3. You know, so that's like, that's like slowing down as you go through the curves or speeding up as you go through the curves. Any, anytime you have a curved path, you've got some change of direction. And if you've got change, you can do change of direction and change of speed at the same time. So you might have some combos. Now, an, a, an interesting example is downward gravity. Straight downward, there's no such thing as horizontal gravity. Uh, it's always straight downward, and it can definitely cause a speed up or a slowdown. We, we know that. If you're on the way down, if you drop something, it's another 9.8 meters per second of downward speed if you're on the way down. But if, if you throw something straight up in the air, you know, like a pop-up, you lose 9.8 meters per second of upward speed. If you've got, if you're popped up, you've got some upward speed to start, but you lose 9.8 meters of upwardness or 9.8 meters per second of upward speed every second that you're in free fall. It's technically in free fall, even though it's not really falling, it's, it's moving upward. Gravity can change, can cause a change in the velocity's direction. And we are going to uh, do um, some sketching with this right now. So um, so 2B is what we're going to amplify on. This downward force, here's the baseball. You know, the, the mass of a baseball is approximately 145 grams, 0 0.145 kil kilograms. Uh, weight force, right? I drew a dot over here uh, to symbolize the center of mass of the baseball. And here's the downward arrow, and I just made it all, any old size, nothing special about that. Uh, but I did compute the weight force, uh, so it would be 1.421 newtons of weight force uh, for a baseball of this mass. Now, um, let's keep going. I, let's talk about the baseball pop-up. And then we're going to talk about another baseball trajectory. If, if, you're, if you pop the ball straight up, you start with some upward velocity, straight up, and you don't have any horizontal. Okay, so Sarah, um, you know, a pop-up is defined as 
uh, x component of the initial velocity zero. Right? Now, driving a Ferrari off a cliff, you have no zero, no vertical, all horizontal. Okay, but a baseball pop up straight up. So it loses speed on the way up. One, it, it loses 9.8 meters per second of upward speed uh, per second on the way up. And by the same token, once it turns around at the very top, oh, did I say turn around? Yes. Gravity causes a change in direction at the very top of the motion, at the extreme point. Uh, and it starts moving back down again. You know, the pop-up doesn't go out into outer space. I mean, even Chuck Norris couldn't hit it. Well, probably Chuck Norris couldn't hit it that hard. Uh, anyways, it's going to gain speed on the way back down. Now, a base hit, hit towards the outfield. Now you're, it, it's, it's going up. It's, you know, it's, it's not a... It's not going straight back towards the pitcher. I mean, that would be going towards the outfield. But if, if it arcs upward and towards the outfield, it goes over the head of the pitcher, um, you're still going to be losing vertical speed on the way up. And you're going to regain vertical speed downward on the way back down. But one thing is true in this case. There's no horizontal gravity... And therefore, the horizontal component of the velocity is unchanged. Gravity is vertical. That means accel that acceleration is vertical. That means all your delta v's are vertical. Let me repeat that. G is vertical. It's downward. Because that is the case, all the delta v's that you observe are going to be downward delta v's you know from one second to the next delta v is going to be downward delta v is not going to be horizontal because there's no such thing as horizontal gravity so there's no such thing as horizontal newtons and therefore there's no such thing as horizontal acceleration and no horizontal delta v all right and so all of its horizontal speed is going to be uh, retained now, let's work this out. I've got some sketches animated up. Here's my baseball. And let's say that this baseball starts off down here. Here's my dotted line at the bottom of the sketch, right down by 4C. And let's give it an upward arrow. There's its initial velocity. And just make it a you know medium-sized arrow. And then I watched the eyeball about three-fourths of the way to the baseball. Draw, draw yourself a horizontal line dashed through the center of the baseball. And then about three-quarters of the way up, I want you to draw another dashed line. And once the baseball gets to that elevation, three-quarters of the way up, it's got about one half the speed. So make this arrow, it's still upward, but it's half as big as the initial arrow. All right. It turns around at the top. So here's my horizontal dashed line through the baseball. That's the turning point. Go ahead and write that phrase down. Turning point. The turning point in the motion. Believe it or not, Turning point in the motion is incredibly important. We see it with baseballs and stuff, and believe it or not, it is extremely important in quantum field theory. The, and the theory of the early universe, the Big Bang Theory. And I mean the real Big Bang Theory, not some hokey television show with a bunch of nimrods running around. Um... Anyways, in the, in the Big Bang Theory, the early universe, turning points, very important in quantum field theory. We won't be going over that this semester, but uh, maybe, maybe next semester. Now, turning point, you're on your way back down. So a short amount of time later, ding, you've got the same velocity, the same size, but now you're downward. 
You know, it's, as the saying go, goes, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Well, here's the Lord taketh thing away up here on the way up and giveth thing back over here on the way down. And when you get back down to uh, the catcher's mitt, you know, back to home plate, it's heading downward. The same speed it had, you know, same number of miles per hour on its speedometer, same number of miles per hour on the radar gun, if you got one, in the right position. Same number of miles per hour as it had when it started out. But I've changed the direction at the turning point, and they're now downward. Now that's a pop-up, fairly easy to work out. And you've had some homework, um, and you're going to have some more homework tonight. And by the way, the homework is set to start at 11.50. So no delay. As soon as you get out of here, you can start on your... Because I know you guys love homework so much. Yeah, right. Anyways, let's do a, let's do a base hit. This is kind of vertically exaggerated. Uh, that would be like a pop-up to the center fielder. But let's work on this one. So go ahead and sketch a parabola. That's a full upside-down parabola. And here's the base, the base level at home plate. And then the landing point out here in the lower right, uh, where it comes back to earth, that's center field somewhere. That's a towering fly ball to center field. All right, now here's the uh, apogee at this level. And let me spell that word for you. A-P-O-G-E-E, -E, apogee, the furthest point from earth. Apo, meaning Greek, Greek word meaning away. G, G-E-E, -E, uh, from the Greek word geo for earth. So this is the point furthest away from the earth. The apogee, and you sometimes hear NASA talking about satellite apogee. Uh, here it is right up here at the top. Anyways, uh, go ahead and sketch that in. All right. Now, let's say that you, you hit with the same upward velocity. So make this first arrow the same size as the pop-up initial velocity arrow. And then go up to the same level, and you're going to have to kind of eyeball it in. Uh, at about this level here, um, you've got your three-quarters of the way up. And you're on the way up, and you've got about half the upward speed. And then here's your up here at the apogee, the turning point in the motion. You have no vertical speed. But now on the way back down, over here, one-fourth of the way down from apogee, and you still got three-quarters of the way to go vertically, uh, you have half the speed back, All right? And so these intermediate arrows, one up, one down, um, over here for the pop-up should be the same size, but um, different locations as these ones over here for the base hit. And then down here, when it the center fielder catches it, you know, he signals, he's, he's going he, and he catches it with his left or right hand in the mitt. Uh, the velocity downward is going to be as big, again, as it was upward to start. But what we haven't sketched in here, and which I'm now going to sketch in, and I want you to sketch in, is just a little teeny bit of horizontal velocity. All right, so here we go. I'm going to get rid of the baseline. All right, now down here to start, right here, you can barely see it. When you hit the ball, put a little teeny arrow, just a little slivery arrow. And that's the horizontal velocity component at time t equals zero when it leaves the bat. And hey, you guys. That's what you got over here.
at the intermediate time, your half speed on the way up, three quarters of the way distance wise, uh, you still have that same little teeny arrow. And guess what? For this uh, path, you have some speed. You can barely see it on the screen. Right up here at the very top, at the apogee, it's just sketching a teeny tiny arrow up there. If you're still moving up there. You haven't stopped. On this trajectory, you, you turn, but it's a turning point up there, but you haven't stopped. You still got some velocity up there, and it's all horizontal. Then on the way back down, ding! You still got you're still you're still kind of poking along to the right, you know, like 1.3 meters per second or whatever it happens to be. And then, ding! Uh, you've got to angle your baseball mitt because it's coming in at an angle. All right, so you want to get it right. The best way to catch it is right, so that you angle it right to catch it with a perfect uh, probability of a full and safe catch. So, in this particular path, the direction of the velocity is changing continuously. You've always got a few meters per second horizontally, but you've also got changing vertical velocity component and so it, it changes continuously it's not a change from one to then the other it changes continuously so over here at the intermediate point um, right here three-fourths of the way up and on the way up your your velocity vector as you should suspect it's parallel to the parabola Kind of, and, and I've kind of moved it away a few centimeters to the side here. But it's a little bit up and a little bit to the right, right as it should be. And then at the, the corresponding location over here, on the right, now you're one-fourth of the way down and you're on the way down. Your velocity vector is slanted here. And the tilt angle of both of these velocities is the same. One's tilted to the right and going upwards. The other one's tilted to the right and going downward. So the whole idea of an acceleration changing the direction of the velocity is encoded and displayed in this diagram. The diagram of a um, baseball heading for the outfield. Questions before we Continue to Newton's third law. Yes? No. Uh, the question was, will we ever have to calculate air resistance? The answer to that is, uh, not in this class. If we were in, you know, like an engineering class, yeah. And guys that design planes and rockets and stuff, you, you know they have to. Parachutes, guys that design parachutes. Parachutes work because of air resistance. Okay, so those guys have to do it, but we're going to kind of ignore it. But you know, like if you're, is, is anybody here in the reserves or the ROTC or anything like that? Uh, I had a friend, a faculty mate a number of years ago, and he was a Army Reserve guy, and his specialty was artillery. And, you know, we were talking about air resistance and he stuff. Yeah, we've got all that stuff worked out, and he could... He told me that from two miles away, he could put a round of artillery into the faculty lounge of the school. Where, and it was, the faculty lounge was like a, about as big as this little area down here. And he could do that from two miles away with impunity. You know, and if, I'm sure it's even better now. That was a number of years ago. So, and, th and those guys have to take into account air resistance, but we're not going to do that. Because it's a whole lot of calculus. All right, another question. Yes? Is your um, velocity vector at the top kind of equal to the horizontal speed? Yep. The, the question was, would your velocity vector at the top just be equal to your horizontal speed? Answer, yes. And so that little vector is also, 
So if I was going to do a fuzzy red vector at the top, it would be a tiny fuzzy red vector at the top. And it would be identical to this little teeny sideways arrow up here. Hmm, maybe I should... Maybe I'll put a question on the exam like that. Very good. All right, let's keep going. I want to talk about Newton's third law, the law of action and reaction. Now, uh, raise your hand if you have a skateboard with you in class today. Hands. Show your hand. One, two. Who else is three? Okay, three of you. Come on down. You in the back, you up here, and you over there to the side. And bring your skateboards. Okay, and let me turn the lights up. We're going to do a demonstration. And what I want you to do is let me try to keep the podcast going. Um, okay, what is your name? Brianna. Brianna. And what is your name? Brock? Brock. Brock. Okay, Brock and Brianna, I want you to stand right here in front of the lectern. Okay, and I want you to mount, and I want you to, Brianna, I want you to face this way. Brock, I want you to face this way towards Brianna. Okay. All right, so go ahead and mount up on your skateboards. Okay, and I want you to skate up so that you're right next to each other. Okay, toe to toe. All right, now what, to, what I want you to do is hold your hands up like this. Okay, like you're going to play patty cake. And... And you have to get up on your skateboards, okay? Completely, so complete. All right, now they're both up there. Now what I'm going to ask these two, Brock, right, and Brianna, I'm going to ask them to do something very simple. I'm going to ask them to push off, okay? And I want you to observe what happens, okay? Wait a minute, I didn't say to push off. <laughs> do over, come on. All right, let's try it again. Wait till I say go. I'm going to count to three. Come on, this is science, man. All right, so mount, So let's do the same thing. Okay. And go ahead and put your hands in contact. Okay. When I say go, one, two, three, go. Okay, now, what did you notice? Brianna went flying quite a bit further than Brock. All right, uh, Brianna, can you move to the side for a second? What's your name? Brandon. 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 Uh, and Brock, was, Brock, you move over to this side. Brandon, you stay on that side. And let's see if it's let's see if it's this side of the room. It, you know, maybe it's downhill or something like that. Okay. All right. All right. Now mounts up. All right. Contact. And then when I say go. <laughs> Dude, <laughs> what? It's pretty squeaky. All right. All right. When I say okay, contact, and when I say go, push up. One, two, three, go. Okay. <laughs> okay. Now notice, <coughs> fairly close to the same motion. All right, Brianna. Switch over to this side. Brandon, switch over to here. And Brock, thanks. But you can stand up here. All right. All right. Now, same thing. And Brianna, I want you to mount up. And Brandon, I want you to and let's, let's do the patty cake contact deal. All right. All right. Okay, contact. <laughs> Brandon's got the squeaky one. One, two, three. Uh, who went flying the most? Brianna. Brianna. Make a note of what you just observed. Okay, thanks, you guys. Let's give them Brianna, Brock, and Brandon a hand. Good. Thank you. Very nice. Now, what we're going to do is apply Newton's third law to the skateboard uh, demonstration. And Newton's third law is basically this. It's known as the law of action and reaction. 
But really, it's it's not a it's not a law about action. It's a law about forces, and the nickname is action reaction. When you push off. Your opposite pushes you back. So that's Brock and Brianna, Brandon and Brock, and then Brianna and Brandon. All right? Three different interactions, three different velocity states immediately after the interaction. And so... But one thing that Sir Isaac Newton says is when you push off your opposite or your interaction, the object with which you're interaction, interacting uh, pushes off with the exact same number of Newtons. And so option or item 1D here says fairly succinctly, whenever two objects interact, the force exerted on one object is equal in size and opposite in direction to the force exerted on the other object. So the force on Brianna is equal in size to the force exerted on Brock. So Brock is quite a bit bigger than Brianna, and Brianna is quite a bit smaller than Brock is. But their interaction force is the same size, just oppositely directed. Why is it? Here's a, here's a uh, rhetorical question for you. Why is it that Brianna really moved to the left and Brock hardly moved at all to the right? Why is that? Second rhetorical question. Why is it that when Brianna and Brandon pushed off, Brianna moved quite a bit to the right, and Brandon, he moved to the left, but not bodaciously so? Why is that? Well, let's keep looking at this football player and we're, we're kind of see if we can work out some of the some of the concepts here. Here's a picture of a UCF football player from a few years back. And one of the things that you can say, you know, he's running down the field. This is a snapshot and he's up on his tippy toe, tippy toes. Right foot is in contact with the ground. His, his left foot is up in the air. He's running. All right. So. Uh, he's actually pushing down into the ground because he's above the ground and he's pushing behind him. So he's trying to push the ground and if, if you've ever been on a track squad and doing sprint events, a lot of times your coach will teach you just throw the track behind you with your feet. Okay, and that's what he's trying to do. So according to Newton's third law, the ground is actually pushing him upward and forward. And that is how he gets down the field. So he's pushing the ground. The, the effective mass of the ground is infinity. And because it's basically the earth, the earth itself. Uh, so, and the ground pushes back on him exactly the opposite direction. So that's this yellow arrow. He's getting a pushback from the ground upward. So that's supporting him, um, his, his downward pull of gravity, and as well as whatever he's pushing with. And then forward towards the end zone, hopefully. And away he goes. Now, thing about this is, it won't work if there's no rigidity force. They never play football on a field made of jello. You ever notice that? Okay, you can't. Or water. You can't play football on a field made of, because there's no, there's no rigidity. So there has to be some pushback from the rigidity of the surface. 
All right, and that is actually in the yellow arrow here. Okay, the yellow arrow is a picture of the some of the rigidity force pushing back on whatever number 35 is pushing into it. All right, so that's the law of action and reaction. Now, similar thing here, up here in the front for Brianna and Brock. For Brandon and Brock. For Brandon and Brianna. All right? They had e their push force. Um, they were in contact for just, you know, like a tenth of a second that they were pushing each other. And then their hands broke contact. And they were no longer pushing, but they'd gotten a little bit of an acceleration from that unbalanced force. Same thing here with uh, Usain Bolt. Look at his... This, in this picture, his left foot. Now, there's a guy that is the master of accelerating down the track. And kind of an interesting guy. People try to analyze his... Look at, you know what's interesting about this? Look at all the other guys. Their feet are off. Nobody else has their feet on the ground. Everybody else is in the air. And I saw one here the other day. He was crossing the finish line. I don't know if it was 100 meters or 200 meters at the Rio Olympics. And he was in the air, and all the other people had their uh, at least one foot on the ground. It was just, it's astounding if you look at these runners. Now, here's another picture: um, an astronaut out in space um, trying to handle some little tiny satellite. All right now, the satellite's made of metal, so it's probably a lot bigger than the astronaut, a lot more kilograms. But they push off the force. Um, from the spacecraft on the astronaut pushes the astronaut to the left. And the force from the astronaut on the spacecraft pushes the spacecraft off to the right. So um, the thing about this, though, and it, it's similar for this example of the astronaut and the satellite, um, different recoil speeds. You know, they're, they're going to go off in different directions, but they not, might not be the same speeds. Kind of like when Brianna was interacting with either Brandon or Brock, um, she had a bigger recoil speed than the other two guys. And then when Brandon and Brock um, interacted and pushed off each other, their interactions, their recoil speeds were uh, a little bit closer together. Right? And even though Brandon escaped, Brandon, it's time to... Uh, Oil up that skateboard or tighten it up or something. It's squeaking up here. But what we're going to try to do is tackle this symmetry issue uh, next week uh, in Chapter 4. And if you feel after the exam, if you want to start reading ahead, um, you can read the very first part of Chapter 4, Section 1. All right, And that will be about... Uh, things like momentum and forces and impulse. And we'll talk about those next week. Before we get to that stuff, I want to talk about a uniform circular motion. And this is about page 38. And actually, uh, this in the textbook, it appears before the third law discussion. Uh, this is a picture from Google Maps. I wasn't able to include it in the textbook. Uh, but you can look at it, Nardo Ring. It's a circular test track uh, down in the boot heel uh, of Italy. It's kind of an interesting place. And um, there's a little bit more of a close-up. And they've got it set up. They built it so that they could test uh, vehicles from Fiat and any, basically anybody that wants to use it. It's very flat and it's, very, and it's perfectly circular. Kind of a cool place. So let's talk about curved trajectories in general. We're doing good here. And I want you to draw kind of a little curved path, something like what I've got up here, if you will. And one thing about the curved path, to go along the curved path, you've got to change the steering wheel. Okay, you've got to go from straight to turning right. And then on this one, you straighten out for a little bit and then you turn left for the second turn. 
All right, now we're going to analyze that. And this again is going to be in terms of changing direction. If the direction changes, the velocity arrow changes. And therefore, there's a, a vector acceleration of some kind. And so all you have to do is look at the path and you know, yep, even if I go through at constant velocity, or excuse me, constant speed, I'm going to have some acceleration. And therefore, I'm going to have to have some good tires on the road surface. You can't drive a road like this without some friction between the tires and the road surface. If you tried driving with tef Teflon coated tires on a frozen lake surface, forget it, you're not going anywhere. You're, you're not going ahead, you're not going back, you're not turning left or right, you ain't going jack, you're not doing jack. You know? So you gotta have some net force, you just look at the path and you can see it. At each point on the curve, there's something that we call the radius of curvature of the curve. So what we're gonna do to understand this idea of radius of curvature is um, sketch in a radius, a circle of curvature at a point on the curve. So go ahead and draw in a dot of some kind. I chose mine here in the first turn. It's a right turn. If you're going from left to right along this track, this is a, you crank the steering wheel a little bit to the right. Okay, what we're going to do is sketch the velocity vector in at this point, and then after we sketch in the velocity vector, we're going to sketch in a, a circle of curvature and get the radius of curvature. All right. So the first thing that you've got to do at this point is just easy and graceful sketch in a tangent line. So that means a line that just touches at this point that you've identified. It doesn't poke through the curve. It just grazes the curve. Now the velocity of the car at that point is along the tangent line. So, and we're assuming that he's going from left to right. So draw in a velocity vector now right along that tangent line. So here's my black arrow right along the tangent line. If he were going uh, from right to left from um, the other direction, I'd draw it in the other direction. Just, you know, same tangent line, but just a different direction. And let's call that vector V. You know, at this instant of time, there's the velocity vector. All right, and I'm going to remove my tangent line now. You don't have to. You don't have to raise yours if you don't want to. All right, now, what I'm going to do now is just lightly sketch in a circle. And I, what I want you to do is eyeball this. Look at this before you sketch it, all right? And here's a little circle. For at least a short distance near this point, the imaginary circle that I just drew, drew sketched in is right along the actual path. All right, so let me move it in. All right, there it is. I put it right up onto the path. All right. And notice that the radius, I've got four radii in this circle, and I've put one of the radii right to this point on the path. All right. So one way you can describe that circle is it matches the path. Even if it's just for a few meters. And you go a few meters down the line, you might have a smaller or a bigger circle with the center at a different point. But for this point on the on the graph, this is about the radius of curvature. The center of that imaginary circle is inside the turn. And I hope that, hope that makes sense to you. Here in 
this region of space-time in our universe, the imaginary circle, the center of that imaginary circle is going to be inside the turn. The velocity vector, which we've sketched, vector v, is tangent to the circle and the path. So that's the idea here. This circle and the path are along each other. They're right on top of each other. And therefore, the tangent vector, the velocity, is tangent to both the path and to this imaginary circle. Now, if you have a circular path, you only have one radius of curvature. We're going to work on circular paths in just a minute. Okay, so that's kind of a side note, number three. Now, let's keep going with this particular path. And let's think about this situation. If the speedometer on this vehicle is constant, um, in other words, you go through this whole, whole curve at a good, easy 10 miles an hour, so 4 point something meters per second. Nice and easy. Um, any acceleration is going to be perpendicular to the velocity. Why do I know that? If I'm traveling at constant speed, I don't have an acceleration to, along the velocity, and I don't have an acceleration, acceleration against the velocity, the opposite direction. I don't have any meters per second squared in the direction of the velocity because it's not speeding up. I don't have any meters per second squared of acceleration in the opposite direction to the velocity arrow, which we've got graphed up here because I'm not slowing down. And what that means is the acceleration, if you're on this path at constant speed, the acceleration vector is straight into the center of that imaginary circle. Oh my goodness. That, my wonderful students, is the whole thing. The acceleration points toward the inside of the turn. It points toward the, at this instant of time, it points toward this, the center of this circle. Now, if you're over here on turn two, your circle is going to be a lot, like if you're right here where my cursor is, at the very bottom of turn two, you're right in the middle of turn two, and you're really cranking it to the left, your center of curvature is going to be above the path on the inside of that turn and it's going to be quite small quite a bit smaller this is the one that we've got sketched in here is quite a bit bigger it's a slower turn we would say this acceleration changes the direction of the velocity and only the direction because we're not speeding up so this is like saying if I say speedometer is constant what I really should be saying is we're on cruise control and I drive around all the time with cruise, you know, my neighborhood, the cops are like, oh, man, they're really bad. They're always looking for speeders. So I got to put my, it's pathetic, riding around with cruise control at 25 miles an hour. Oh, man. But in my neighborhood, you have to. All right. So I, and I, you know, the streets aren't all straight, but I still have to go 25. This is what I do. All right. The amount of force that's required is either smaller or greater, depending on how fast you're going. If you're going slowly, you can take it on really bad tires. But if you're going fast, you better have some good grip on those tires. Also, the tightness of the curve, the radius of curvature at any given point. So if you're, so what I'm saying is, at this point that we've got sketched out, your tires might have enough grip, enough frictional force to keep you on the path. But they, you know, you might fail over here at the, if you keep the same speed on this really tight turn, turn two down here, and you're going to go off the, off the road, you know, lose control of your vehicle and go off the road. 
So it depends on the speed, the tightness of the curve, or the radius of curvature. Because the acceleration is always toward the center of the turn on cruise control, the net force is always toward the center. And so I have a picture of tires here. The tires have to produce that gripping force, the tires and the road surface. So you have to have good tires, plenty of good friction. And, it, you know, that's, that's the challenge. A good tire, you know, you have to have a little bit of friction but not too much, you know. Now, let's talk about an Ardo ring in specific. Here's the overhead picture of it from space, and we're focusing in on it. There it is, and we're getting closer. Now we're overhead, All right? Now, this thing has two different lanes. The outermost lane of the Nardo ring uh, is optimized for 149 miles per hour. All you need is the speed and the radius of curvature, and you know what kind of force um, is required. If you go faster than that, you actually have to crank the steering wheel a few degrees. In other words, you got to apply a little bit more force to keep yourself on the track. Now, the innermost lane of the Narda ring is for testing trucks. So for that one, they've got it. And it's banked as well. There's some banking. And so that one's banked for 50 miles an hour. Just like, you know, I was watching uh, uh, the uh, University of Tennessee versus Virginia Tech football game. And they were playing it at the Bristol, Tennessee uh, Speedway. And, man, those, ba those turns were really banked. Uh, and that's the same thing here. You bank it for a particular speed um, and so for the outermost lane its particular speed is 149 um, and for the innermost uh, lane it's 50 miles an hour. Now what we're going to do next is derive a couple equations on a simple circular path constant speed uniform circular motion. Write that word down in your notes. And when we're finished, um, hopefully we'll have time to do a little mini-review. If we don't get to the mini-review, um, it's all right. You've got some mini-review in, going in web courses in about 15 minutes. So, uniform circular motion. What that means is you're on a circle, and you're on cruise control. Your speed is constant. And what we're going to do is look at the velocity and the location of an object in uniform circular motion at two different instants of time. So uh, here's my first circle, time t1, and here's my second circle, time t2. And at time t2, uh, the object has moved counterclockwise a little bit, and it's got a slightly different velocity vector but the same speed, right? So we're on cruise control on the Nardo ring. Time T1 and time T2. Oh my goodness, I could give you guys some really tough Nardo ring problems. Miles per hour, meters per second. But let's just focus on this one. The, you're on a circle, so the radius is the same everywhere along the circle. That's how it's designed. All right now, I'm going to try to uh, get my rearrange my circles here. Hopefully, you've got your circles, and hopefully, you've got some room to write some more stuff. Uh, let me kind of park these. Um, and what I'm doing now is I took this location uh, radius, this radius vector here in black, where my cursor is. It's, it's at about 2 o'clock on circle number 2. And I put it over here um, in the first circle. All right, And that forms two radii separated by about, I don't know, 30 degrees or so. All right, And there they are. And so I'm going to park it over here to the side. So go ahead and copy those two radii. All right, just like that, about 30 degrees apart. 
and just kind of park it over here. And I got mine down towards the middle here. All right now, we're going to do the same thing with the two velocity vectors. All right, these two velocity arrows. All right, here they are. There's the pair of them. I've copied velocity number two over here to velocity uh, number one. And okay, now I'm going to, there they are. And so I'm going to park that in the upper right. All right, so kind of copy those two. And, and hey, you guys, if those are perpendicular to the two radii, uniform circular motion, then those will be 30 degrees apart as well. So make those two uh, sets of arrows. Well, actually, this is a set of line segments for position. And the velocity is a pair of arrows. Make them the same 30 degree angle. All right, now I'm going to move my circles up to the upper left and make my two triangles a little bit bigger. So down here in the lower left is my position triangle. And over here in the upper right is my velocity triangle. Connect the dots on your position triangle. All right, and that makes it a triangle. And hey, you guys, put in the radius R and R. What kind of triangle is that called? Isosceles, yeah, it's an isosceles triangle. Uh, this distance here, this dashed line, is the approximate distance of travel. So V delta T, approximate. Now, let's do the same thing up here for the velocity triangle. All right, go up here to your velocity arrows and just kind of connect tip to tip, arrowhead to arrowhead, and another isosceles triangle. And it's the same shape. Go ahead and make a note. Um, isosceles, V and V. And because this is a 30 degree angle right here, between the two V's, it's also the same shape, not necessarily the same size as the position triangle. Uh, what would we call this quantity up here, this dashed line up here for the velocity triangle? Think. What's that? Change of direction. You're you're hot, but it's not. You're 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 very warm, but you're not. That's not exactly what it is. It is it 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 encodes the change in direction, but also something else. Yeah. Uh, it itself is not the acceleration. What do you think? No, it's, it, it's not the change in the angle of the direction. Anybody else? Delta V. Delta V. All right, that's my delta V vector. Delta V. All right. Um, so just make a side note. The two triangles are similar, you know, from high school geometry, similar triangles. That means the angles are equal. The sides are proportional. So if you take a ratio of the long side of one triangle to the long side of the other triangle, then that'll be equal to the ratio of any other pair of corresponding sides. Also, the approximate distance is approximately V delta T. And this is the key for us to get a Holt See, because we've got a delta V over here. Look at this. We've got delta V over here. And down over here, this is going to be a V delta T right here. Oh, my goodness. So let's make a proportion. The first quotient here, R over V, that is the isosceles sides, position on top, speed triangle down below, R over V, isosceles sides. Now this one over here, this proportion, 
They're proportional triangles. You can do this. Over here, this is the base. V delta T, that's the base of the position triangle. And the denominator here in this quotient, the second quotient in the proportion, is delta V. That's this guy over here from the velocity triangle. All right? So these are the isosceles base, also position over speed. All right? Now, make sure you write that proportion the way we've got it. Does anybody see an acceleration in there? No. Who sees an acceleration? Raise your hand if you could see an acceleration. What do you see? Okay, green shirt, what do you see? If you flip the equation, you can get delta V over delta T. You see it now? It's in there. Da, 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 and rearrange terms. Da, 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 da. Delta V over delta T. And then the leftovers, you get two V's on the other side in the numerator. So that's V squared. And this R that was on top in the left is now in the bottom on the right. And that, my wonderful students, is the formula for centripetal acceleration. Let me spell that word for you, centripetal. C-E-N-T-R-I-P-E-T-A-L. Centripetal. A equals V squared over R. Now I'm going to go to the next page, and, and we got it right here. Because of proportional triangles, it is true, and interpreting delta V over delta T, we can say that the centripetal acceleration is V squared over R. Centripetal force is M times that, MA, F equals MA. So centripetal force... is equal to m times v squared over r. Your homework tonight, you're going to be working with a set of, I think, five or six questions all about the velocity vectors for a point on a bicycle wheel at two separate times, kind of like what we did here. The bicycle wheel is going to be turning at 80 RPM. And so it's going to turn a certain number of degrees per second. You can work that out. You're going to be analyzing very carefully made diagrams of that 80 RPM bicycle wheel. You're also going to be doing some third law, and then you have the review assignment. Now, what we're going to do uh, right now, we're out of time. So we're going to do the, uh, we're not going to do the clicker review that I was hoping to do today, but you'll have a review homework in web courses. And homework five. So two homeworks. They should be running in just a few minutes. Okay, you're dismissed. Come early and be ready for anything on Thursday. See you then.